L last night we had a conversation that went into the night and there was one point in the conversation where a subject come up that that often comes up we, you know we didn't spend a lot of time there but it's a common subject in connection with the presentation of this prophetic message and it's not s simply a common subject it's a many times it's a stumbling block for people to not receive this message and that's um, you know I'll give you an example <laughs> of how extreme it can get at one time we did some meetings in Canada and the 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 pastor that had it had us there he was there the whole time and uh, I don't think he was being honest about his participation we had two meetings set up up there at two different churches and um, when the the higher ups found out about it they let the one pastor who was a new pastor know if you have him at your church you're going to be fired and then we found out through the grapevine this other pastor was a long time in the church and he agreed with to with the conference brethren to handle it a different way and that was just to be at the meeting to <coughs> participate and he did and he had two really nice teenage daughters that throughout the meetings would come up and do special music so he was and he, he and I you know he, there was only one time that in a question and, a question and answer period where he actually you know participated in asking questions and he had a he had a he had a wrong understanding on the daily but uh, I was definitely not aggressive or unkind I was being very delicate about it I knew who he was and but it didn't there wasn't a, it wasn't like there was a controversy about it. he asked a question I answered and it moved on there was no reason to suspect anything and then this, the Sabbath after we finished those meetings we hear from his church family that he um, that his presentation one of the things that he made in his presentation was you know Pippinger knows a lot about prophecy but he doesn't know anything about Jesus Christ <laughs> all right so a lot of people hear the prophetic message <laughs> and they think you know I hear a lot of the prophecy 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 but where is practical Christian experience where is Jesus Christ and so th this is a common question about people that are trying to trying to receive and appreciate this message and it's it goes to the extreme that the opponents of this message will make that an argument okay you're not hearing you know sanctification justification Obe obedience, faith, uh, all the, the the attributes of salvation theology. You're just hearing about prophetic illustrations and um, historical fulfillments and dates and lines and where's Jesus Christ and all this. And um, I think the testimony of the Word of God is that that we are Laodiceans, okay and. There's one, Sister White comments on Laodiceans often, and one of the places she said the greatest deception that could come, on human, come upon a human mind is to think that everything is all right when everything is all wrong. That's the Laodicean condition. Mm -hmm. You think that Christ is within you, but he, he's not in you. And, and for me, and I wasn't raised in Adventist, I came out of the world when I was 25 years old and I grew up in Southern California in the 60s and when I became a Christian my hair was as long as most of the sisters in here. That's where I was at, Southern California with long hair in the 1960s. So you should figure out where I was at when I came to the Lord and I came to the Lord all on my own. Okay, I, at my work experience I found the Bible and I used to hide out and read that Bible just for something to do in an intoxicated condition because I was intoxicated 24-7 back then and I s realized that there was something in this Bible that was genuine and, and I came into the message not with someone coming and knocking on my door giving me Bible studies or me signing up for Bible studies I read myself into Christianity and the first time someone asked me if I was a Christian it was an old Seventh-day Adventist brother that we were moving in next door to him and he comes out and says, are you and your wife Christians? And the first time I everybody asked me that and I thought, well, yeah, you know, I've been reading the Bible for a couple of months. I guess so. I didn't know what a Christian was. Um, my point being is, is, as I've interacted with Adventists through the years, I've realized that Adventists that are born and raised as Adventism, they, they have some understanding about what a, being a Christian Seventh-day Adventist is that's a little bit different than mine okay 
mine was, was for me, my experience with, with Jesus Christ is based upon what I hear him saying to me from the inspired word of God, which is the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, okay? So I'm kind of simplistic, and I, and I have problems, and I have baggage that the Lord is going to have to remove and deal. I'm not saying uh, that isn't the case, but some of the customs and traditions that I see that many Seventh-day Adventists seem to possess, I don't possess them, okay? Uh, as an example, I think some Seventh-day Adventists are almost Catholic in their attitude on, on their relationship to church authority, okay? Church authority is ordained by the Lord. I'm not, not saying that God isn't a God of organization and that we should do things uh, that glorify Him in an organized fashion. And, and uh, we're not supposed to cut down the Lord's anointed. David's, David gives us a good example of that. But we're to follow Christ, all right, first and foremost. So what I'm saying is, for me, I have a more of a simplistic approach, I think, that some. When I read the Laodicean Council, it's saying that if you are going to understand who you are at the end of the world as an Adventist Christian, then the first thing that you have to say, if you're going to walk with the Lord, the first thing you've got to admit, I don't know if it's the first thing, but it's one of the first things, is that I'm in the condition where I really don't know who Jesus Christ is. Yeah. I think I have Jesus Christ, but he's telling me through his word, you're all wrong. You don't have me. I'm outside of you. I want to come in, but you won't let me in because you think I'm already there. Okay? So, as I was led into the type studies I do, one of the quotes that came across me from the Spirit of Prophecy that made sense to me is Selected Messages, Book 1, page 121, which says, the greatest need in the first work of every Seventh-day Adventist Christian, this is a paraphrase, our first work, our greatest need, is to seek for a revival. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's page 121. And then page 128, she says, revival means renewal of spiritual life. Okay, and my simplistic logic says if my first work and my greatest need is to be revived, then that means that I'm spiritually dead. And that agrees with what I read in the Laodicean condition. For me, I make that assumption about Adventism in general. I know there's people, there's Enochs in every age. I realize that there are people in Adventism that have a genuine, ongoing, sanctified Christian walk with the Lord. But the point of reference that Jesus gives us in God's word is that God's people at the end of the world are self-deceived. They think they know who Jesus is, but they don't. And his remedy is, in Testimonies to Ministers, page 113, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, there will be seen among us a great revival. Okay. Our greatest need is for a revival, and the revival comes from God's prophetic word. At that level, I do not have to define how the Lord accomplishes that revival in me through his prophetic word, exercising faith. And I like what Sister White says. You know, I've seen some theologians' <laughs> definitions of what faith is, and I like what Sister White says more than once. She says, faith is simply taking God at his word. Amen. Okay? So at that simple level of faith, if the Lord says, brother, you are dead in your trespasses and sins, and the only way I can awaken you is through my voice in my prophetic word, and your responsibility is to seek to be awakened in the way that I command you to be awakened, which is his prophetic word, then I know that when Sister White says every Seventh-day Adventist is required to be a student of prophecy, I know why she says that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not a student of prophecy, you will not be awakened from your Laodicean condition. You will not be revived. You are <coughs> sleeping the sleep of death. All right? So... My first argument about those that want to say they do not see Jesus Christ in the prophetic word is 
as Laodicean, the prophetic testimony is, is that Seventh-day Adventists do not know who Jesus Christ is in the first place. So how can they judge whether they are seeing him in his prophetic word or not? Laodiceans do not know who Jesus Christ is. They think that he's in them. So their, whatever their understanding and definition of Jesus Christ is, that's who they think is in them. But the prophetic word says, I'm not in you. I would like to be in you. So, my first argument is, is where, uh, what kind of spiritual uh, arrogance, and I'm not trying to be rude with anyone, but what kind of pride or elevation are we at to identify that God's prophetic word, however it is brought about, is not the voice of Jesus Christ speaking to our soul. Now, I don't know, I don't know why God's prophetic word, when it, it talks about the mighty angel in Revelation 10 coming down, putting his one foot upon the land and one foot upon the sea, I don't know how the Holy Spirit can use those verses there to change my life or empower me or convict me. But at the level of simply taking God at his word, I understood, have understood, that his entire word contains his creative power, the same power that he used to create the universes. So somehow, some way, even by reading about a mighty angel coming down and putting his foot upon the land and the sea, by faith, I say, even if I don't understand how that relates to the correct understanding of justification or prayer or sanctification or obedience, that his power is in that word and he tells me in his word that his word will always accomplish what he's designed it for and what he's designed for his people at the end of the world is that they be awakened and raised up as a mighty army and according to every place but in Ezekiel 37 what awakens us and stands us up as a mighty army the army of Israel is the prophetic word. I have to read this this little thing now to reflect if I you want to read just a little just it kind of fits into what you're talking about. Just it's right in there. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. Without the law men have no just conception of the purity and holiness of God or of their own guilt and uncleanness. They have no true conviction of sin and feel no need of repentance. Not seeing their lost condition as violators of God's law, they do not realize their need of the atoning blood of Christ. The hope of salvation is accepted without a radical change of heart or reformation of life. Thus superficial conversions abound and multitudes are joined to the church who have never been united to Christ. By the word and the spirit of God are open to men the greatest principles of righteousness in body in his law. Where, thank you, where, where I was, where I'm going next, I think maybe fits in a little bit with that. If you go to Hebrews, um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be antagonistic to anyone that has these concerns. I know they're common concerns, and I know that people that are sympathetic with this message, trying to promote this message, have these concerns. Um, and I know that some people are just antagonistic, but I'm not trying to be now. I'm trying to explain some of, some of the reason I understand that the work the Lord has given me is to present the prophetic message that he's allowed me to recognize. And um, he may not be leading me in, in every other discourse to do a breakdown on the cross, all right? And, but I'm not trying to uh, denigrate the cross, which is the center of everything, all right? Um, but in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, it says, For when the time you ought to be teachers... Evidently, according to Paul, there is a time when we ought to be teachers. Who's Hebrews written for? 
maybe the theologians would disagree with me, but Hebrews is the book in the Bible for Seventh-day Adventists, all right? This is, this is the book for us because we're the ones that understand the heavenly sanctuary. The, the book of Hebrews was given to Adventism. And in this book, it says to Seventh-day Adventists, there's a time when you ought to be teachers. If you keep your finger in Hebrews 5 and go to Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, it says, And they that be wise, and if you have a marginal reference for wise, it says teachers. Okay, and they that be teachers shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. What are these teachers going to do? Turn many to what? There's only one kind of righteousness. They that be teachers will turn many to Christ righteousness. All right? Okay, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Now we've got the element of time when the teachers are going to turn, do the, accomplish the work of turning many to righteousness. Okay? Seal up thy book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Here's this time again. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. What's that mean? What's it mean? What, when Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. When he says, at the time, remember what Hebrews says, the time that you ought to be teachers. When the time arrives that you ought to be teachers, that time is when the book of Daniel is unsealed and there's an increase of knowledge. At that period of time, what takes place? Well, many are going to be led to Christ's righteousness, but they're going to be purified, made white, and try it. Where do we get purified, brothers and sisters? Prayer? Where? Where do we get purified? Wrong. Brothers and sisters, where we get purified is at the foot of the cross. When we surrender our sins to Jesus Christ and we are justified, we are purified. That's justification. What begins at that point? Given the robe of Christ's righteousness. And what color is that robe? Many are going to be purified, made white, and what? <coughs> What's that? What did we just go through? What did we just go through, brothers and sisters? Three angels' messages, but what did we just go through? <coughs> the work of the Holy Spirit. Conviction of sin. Purified. Righteousness. White. Judgment. Tried. What is that? Three angels', three angels messages. messages. It's the threefold testing process that the lion of the tribe of Judah places his people into at the time when they ought to be teachers. Is it not? There's not four statements there. There's three. Purified, tried. Purified, made white, and tried. In the correct order. Judgment is the third of those steps of the Holy Spirit. Yes, it's the same thing. I counsel to thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire and white raiment and I said, all right, threefold testing process. Now, now I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ is the one that accomplishes the work of justification and sanctification and glorification in each of our lives if we'll participate in the work that he's done. He, he does that. And we can teach that. We can talk about the cross, that at the cross we're justified, and this is where the, the life of sanctified, a sanctified experience with the Lord begins, and if faithful we're going to be glorified. We can talk about that. Praise the Lord. Let's talk about that. But what we're dealing with with prophecy... This 3-1 combination, this is that identical truth. 
It's the identical truth taken to the level that the Lion of the tribe of Judah wants us to go to because he wants us to understand the purification process that he's placing his people in right now. And what purifies him, according to their word, is an increase of prophetic knowledge that purifies, makes white, and tried. How does that happen? I don't know. But faith is simply taking God at his word. It's simply taking God at his word. There's something about these truths that take justification, sanctification, and faith, and love, and obedience to a level that is not the milk of the word. Go back to Hebrews 5, verse 12. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ha, huh, when's the time ye ought to be teachers? Brothers and sisters, 99% of Seventh-day Adventists, if you read that first part of that verse to them and said right now, when is it that we're supposed to be teachers, they would sit there and have no idea. Now, brothers and sisters, let me ask you, when is it that God's people are supposed to be teachers? Yeah. Why? Because we can, we can identify that a time of the end arrived, right? We know that now is the time that we're supposed to be teachers, how do we know it? Because the line of the tribe of Judah is opening up his word to us to a level that those in Adventism that are very comfortable hearing about the cross and faith and love can't conceptualize. All right, and I, I'm not trying to be critical, I'm trying to be accurate. All right. I mean, I, I know those people that attack this message saying they don't see Jesus Christ in it, and I know that many of them sit in churches listening to presentations about faith and love and the cross that you could go into a Sunday church and hear the identical sermon. Amen. All right? I'm sorry. That's the truth. I've been in an Advent, Adventist community long enough to know that that's the truth. At the end of the world, the increase of knowledge takes the understanding of Christ and everything that is contained in the cross and the experience of his people to a level to where they're able to stand in a time period when there is no longer any intercession of sin. He gives them the intellectual understanding where they know how to do that and he gives them the experience where they can handle it. They're settled into the truth both intellectually and spiritually so that they will not be moved. And I, I don't know why it is, but from, from my reading of it, the Lord says the first thing he has to do is give us the intellectual. And that's what Sister White says. Sister White says characters, thoughts and feelings combined go to make up moral character thoughts and feelings combined. And she further says, if your thoughts are right, your feelings will be right. So when we're talking about being sealed intellectually and spiritually, the first thing that we need to get straight is the intellectual. The first thing the line of the tribe of Judah does is he takes us to his prophetic word and puts the truth in place for us in order that our feelings, our lower nature, our emotional system is in agreement with our intellectual, because both of those have to be sealed. And I'm telling you that from my understanding, the Lion of the tribe of Judah understands that we need such an experience with Jesus Christ to stand in this crisis that's about to take place that we cannot attain that experience from the same o same o that's been going on in Adventism for the last hundred years. All right? So, yeah, yeah, like it like was just pointed out from the floor. If we'd have accomplished it already, we'd already be home. Okay, so I'm saying that the prophetic word is the voice of Christ speaking to our souls, but I do not have the ability or the understanding to explain how he accomplishes the transformation in my life through that word, but I do have an understanding based upon the word of God that his word does not return unto him void. Okay? And that there is power in every one of his words. 
So in, in Hebrews 5, it, verse 12, it says, for, when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not strong drink. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use of their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, leaving what principles of the doctrine? Of what? Christ. Leaving those principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Ah, perfection is something that takes place beyond the doctrine of Christ. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance and dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on hands and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Present truth is something that's at a, a, a level that's beyond the 27 fundamental doctrines of Adventism that we sign up to when we're... we're baptized into the church. Hebrews 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, as Laodiceans, we become comfortable with milk. That's what the Bible says. We become comfortable with milk. And Jesus Christ at the end of the world knows that milk is not going to provide us the nutrition that we need to stand in this coming crisis. Okay? The prophetic word is meat. All right? It's meat that has to be eaten and digested. But at the simple level, at the, at the milk level of God's word, his entire word has the power to change hearts, change minds. His entire word, if we will but eat it. We're in the time period when we are called to be teachers. We're in the time period where Sister White says there's many wonderful truths in the word of God, but what the flock of God needs now is present truth. Okay. Now, for instance, right here, I can spend time, I can spend time, if this would satisfy a soul, but I won't spend time. I'm going to do it now to try to make an illustration. In the middle of the 2300 year prophecy, we have a 3-1 combination in the time of Christ. Right? Everyone with me right here? The first way mark is the work of John the Baptist, paralleling William Miller being the first way mark, and Elijah being the first way mark, and Moses being the first way mark. The second way mark is the Sanhedrin, the resistance of of the enemies of that time to the work of that time, the resistance of the Sanhedrin to the work of John the Baptist and of Christ, paralleling the Protestants closing their doors on the Millerites and Pharaoh saying, gather your own straw. But the third way, Mark, what's the third way, Mark? Judgment. It's the cross. It's judgment. It's the cross. Therefore, this third way, Mark, is the cross. This third way, Mark's the cross. This third way, Mark's the cross. This third way, Mark's the cross. I can talk about the cross over and over again if I choose to from these scenarios. But brothers and sisters, the line of the tribe of Judah is trying to not be redundant about the cross. He's trying to teach us things about the cross that Laodiceans have not yet recognized. All right? For instance, down here, where are we? Down here. At the Sunday Law? That's the cross for us, brothers and sisters. When we talk about the Sunday law, you need to understand that this is where the cross comes in. All right, in all its ramifications, all right? This is the, the, the people choosing between Barabbas and Christ, that's there. Amen. But so is the death of Christ there. Okay? What are the ten kings going to do in verse 14 of Revelation 17? They're going to make war with the Lamb. And what Sister White say, how, does, how do they accomplish that? In the person of his people. And in Maranatha 199, she says there will be many martyrs. 
the cross. The cross, it's introducing us into Christ shedding his blood one more time again there. Right, so you can spend time on that, and perhaps, per, and, I, and by the way, <laughs> I don't have any, any conviction whatsoever that, that I teach this message correctly. I teach this message based on the logic I have, and I give it my best shot, but that doesn't mean that I think that I'm doing it correctly. Maybe I should be presenting a little bit more of the cross and the love of Jesus and the faith of Jesus. That's possible. I, I'm a human being. I've made lots of errors in the past. But I'm giving you my logical reason why I purposely don't go down those avenues too much is because I believe that the transformation that has to take place among the dead, dry bones of Laodicea is accomplished through their willingness to receive the little book of prophecy at this time period and eat it and consume it that it might become part of them and change their life. And I believe it's a life or death message. Sister White says we have a life or death message. And if we get distracted from consuming that book, I, I heard a saying when I first became a Christian, I've always liked it, don't know who said it, but I, I think it's accurate. We're either feeding on Jesus Christ or we're feeding on one another All right. as Christians. If we get distracted from eating this little book in the time that we ought to be teachers, then I don't care what it is, it's poison. It's poison. When Jesus says, you need to eat this, and when did Jesus use, lose most of his disciples? <laughs> you need to eat my, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Do all the prophecies point to the end of the world? Where do most of the disciples at the end of the world turn away? When the little book is offered to them. Brothers, brother, we don't turn away at the Sunday law. Sister White's clear. We make our decision about the Sunday law long before the Sunday law. Where we turn away and are prepared for the mark of the beast is when Christ offers us his flesh and blood to eat and we decide, what does he mean by that? We're not cannibals. And we turn away from that command of his and throw away the only nutrition that prepares us to stand faithfully at the Sunday law. Okay? So, go ahead. That's why the temple is finished before the third decree. And Sister White's clear. She says it in, in a variety of ways. We are making our choice about the Sunday law step by step every day. We're, we're sealing which direction we're going in. Okay? We're making the choice right now. If I'm stepping on your toes, if I'm right, if what I'm teaching is correct, and you're finding what I'm saying even on this DVD or in this room right now, if you're finding it offensive, if what I'm saying is correct, and you use what I'm saying here as an excuse to turn away from eating this little prophetic book, you're making a choice that if you live to the Sunday law, it will have contributed to you receiving the mark of the beast. Okay, but... Um, okay. I answered a question that I was asked before this meeting started. I mean, that's my answer. I don't know if it's a good answer, but that's my answer. I am too stupid as a Laodicean to determine what food the Lord needs to give me. I have to go to his word and allow him to say, eat this or don't eat this. And from what I understand, the only thing that awakens a Laodicean is his prophetic word. And in his prophetic word, in order to study his prophetic word, the only way I've ever been able to study his prophetic word is to allow the line of the tribe of Judah to lead me wherever he wants me to go in his prophetic word. And I believe this is why the 144,000 are identified as those that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Amen. He leads them through the prophetic revelation to a point to where he can change their lives and lift them up as an ensign before the whole world. But one of the tests in that leading of the Lamb is that it doesn't seem to be the same teaching technique <coughs> or the same emphasis that I've heard in Adventism since I was a little boy or a little girl. And my argument there is, brothers and sisters, the argument that was made from the back. If that was the right teaching emphasis, we wouldn't be here right now. All right. 
but, but you haven't accomplished the task. In Great Controversy 343, no, I don't want to start there. Um, where do I want to start? I'm sorry, I should have had, maybe I did have this open, I think I closed it. I want to do a, a presentation that I think everyone in this room has already heard, but I want to put it in the record here. Review and Herald, April 29th, 1875. Review and Herald, April 29th, 1875, says the entire history of the children of Israel was written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. No Hebrew could so fully estimate the sacredness and exalted character of God's law as those who accepted Christ as their Redeemer. He was the foundation of the entire Jewish, the entire Jewish system. As an example, of, of what some would say I leave Christ out of these presentations. She just said that Christ was the foundation of the entire Jewish system. But I know that often I'll say, as I'm going to say right now, go to Isaiah 58, 12. Isaiah 58, 12 says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. But who's the foundation? Jesus. So as we're teaching these things, we point out that William Miller was the one that raised up the foundation in the, the history, the first way mark of his history, that the foundation of the temple was laid in the time of the first decree, that the first work of Noah was to build a foundation for him to erect the ark upon, that the first work of Moses was to present the Sabbath because his message was worship. <coughs> and in so doing, what we are doing when we teach that is at least twofold. We're fulfilling Isaiah 58, 12. They that be of thee shall raise up the foundations of many generations. We're doing the very work that's marked in the scriptures that will be done by God's final people on earth. But at the same time, we're bringing the witnesses together to prove that one of the things that happens in Adventism at this very waymark time is that they return to the foundations of Adventism. And you can say all that, and people will not understand that when you're saying it, what you're saying is that Jesus Christ is the foundation of every one of those reform movements. But you are, because he was the foundation of the entire Jewish economy, and the Jewish economy illustrates the Adventist economy. It, a it represents the Christian economy. Jesus is the foundation. Okay. So you, you, can, you can spend time doing that. But brothers and sisters, we're supposed to be eating the meat. We're already supposed to understand the milk. Amen. And time is very restricted in these presentations. Okay. Um, in Exodus 24, let's go there. Am I being, am I, is my tone of voice being too, okay? Because <laughs> I'm actually in a good mood. I hope you're not thinking that I'm uh, being belligerent. I'm not. This is a common discussion in this message. We're going to look at three histories, four histories, three histories, four histories, so to speak. <coughs> the history of Moses, the history of the first Pentecost, the Christian church, the history of the Millerites, and today. All right. And by looking at those histories, we're going to try to say that those histories are the voice of Christ. And that's, that's a specific punchline. This, uh, it was 
I was, didn't intend to have this lead in, this first 20 minutes or whatever it was about the voice of Christ. Even without doing that, the punchline of where we're going with this presentation is that these three histories we're going to look at represent the voice of Christ to you and I at the end of the world. And there are three histories where he entered into covenant with his people. And my contention is, in order for me to or enter into covenant with you or for God to enter into covenant with us, we have to have some kind of agreement. The Lord can't enter into covenant with someone that he hasn't spoken to. All right? There has to be an agreement. Therefore, for the Lord to enter into covenant with God's people at the end of the world, he has to speak to them and get a response from them. And I'm suggesting that this particular presentation is the Lord speaking to us, saying, I am now wishing to enter into covenant with you. All right? And if you do not hear his voice in this, if you do not understand that he's actually doing this at this time, and, but we find out that we're correct in our understanding, then this is a life or death message. If he's truly saying, I want to enter into covenant with 144,000 at this time, and we don't hear it, then we receive the mark of the beast or die lost souls before the Sunday law crisis. In verse 1 of Exodus 21, it says, And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And why is Moses going up here? To receive instructions on building the sanctuary. If you drop down to verse 12, Verse 12, Exodus 24 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God, and he said to the elders, What? Tarry ye here. Okay, in this history there is a tarrying time. All right. Was there a, history of a, t a tarrying time in the history of the Millerites? Was there a tearing time in the history of Pentecost? Yes. Okay, these are parallel histories. Tear you here for us until we come again unto you, and behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. And if any man have any manners to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode upon the mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it how many days? Six, Six days. And the seventh day, on the seventh day, he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire and on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went up into the midst of the cloud and got him up in the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. So how long is he on the mountain? 46 days. Um, I have a set of notes here but I was looking for. I, but this is an older set of notes. And the, the newer set of notes on this subject, Sister White very plainly says, she has a very nice statement where she says Moses was on the mount 46 days. Okay, some people struggle with the math here, but he was. And, and so what we're saying is, in the history of Moses, which is the first history we're looking at, there's a tearing time. And there is 46 days noted. And in those 46 days, what's Moses receiving instruction on? Instructions on building the temple. Read it. That's what he is. He's getting instructions on how to build the tent sanctuary. All right. In John 2, go to John 2, verse 18. I'm going to be awkward up here. Uh, the, the first time I put this presentation together, I dealt with all three histories simultaneously. And then later I, I realized that for me it's better to deal with one history at a time and then go to the next history and go to the next history. But I have these old notes here where, where I'm wanting to do one history at a time, but I'm, gonna, I'm jumping to several histories. So forgive me, but we'll work through this. Y it, this is pretty easy to see. I think that's part of the significance of this is how easy it is to see. In John chapter 2, Jesus cleanses the temple for the first time at the beginning of his ministry. He had just been baptized, went into the, the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. 
comes back into the environment of the Jews. He cleanses the temple. And uh, in verse 17, it says, And his disciples, after he cleansed the temple, remember that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So what's the subject that Jesus gives to them about building the temple? In three days I'm going to raise this temple up, but they thought it was the temple of his, uh, the, the earthly temple, and he was talking about the temple of his body. And then in verse 20, the Jews said, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? So in the time of Christ, or let's say Pentecost, Pentecost, we see that the scriptures note 46 years in connection with building the temple. Right? Pardon me? Uh, in, in the history of Christ, if you want to call, call it the history of Christ, do so. But Pentecost is, is in the history of Christ. That's what I'm talking about. In the reform movement of Christ. In the reform movement of Christ here in the 3-1 combination, the fourth way mark is Pentecost. It's included in that history. So you, you can consider it as an entire package if you choose so. And I'm choosing to do so because when Moses goes up and receives instruction for building the temple and receives the law of God, that's commemorated um, by the Jews throughout all their generations forever. At Pentecost. Pentecost is when Moses is receiving the law. Pentecost is the period of time when the uh, 70 elders were to tarry on the mountain. So I'm saying that, that the beginning of ancient Israel is predicting the end of ancient Israel and that these are two parallel histories. And so I'm classifi classifying it as Pentecost. And then when we deal with Millerite history, it's the time period of the midnight cry. Okay? And uh, in Numbers 14, 33, and 34, I know that you all know this. Moses is the first one to identify the year-day principle. A year is represented by a day. So when Moses is 46 days in receiving instructions on the cross, Moses is also the one that gives the principle as a day is a year. So this 46 days, it's easy to, to see the connection with the 46 years. And they both have to do with the construction of the temple. All right. If you go back to Exodus 33, how many have heard this study? We did it earlier this year at the Prophecy School here in Tennessee. Raise your hand high. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, only a few people have heard this study? Okay, that's good. Then I'll slow down a tad. Exodus 33. What did you say about numbers? 14 verses 33 and 34. Yeah, I, 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 as far as the year-day principle, you've got numbers in Ezekiel. But the reason that I'm saying numbers, okay, is because it's Moses that's recording it, and it's Moses that's recording the history of him receiving the law, and I just want you to understand that Moses understood the year-day principle, okay? Oh, okay? He's the first one to record it, and numbers. it's numbers in 14, 33, 34, and 14, when he's up there in 46 days... It's, it's a prophetic application. Exodus 33. Everyone there? Exodus 33, verse 21 says, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with what? Moses is going to get covered with the Lord's hand. Right? All right. While I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So in this history, when Moses is receiving the law, we find that the Lord puts his hand over something and removes his hand. And when he removes his hand, Moses has a revelation of what? Of his glory. 
of God's glory, of his character. One of the, the most profound revelations of God's character in the scriptures is here. But what I want you to see, it's when the Lord removes his hand that he gives Moses an increase of knowledge, all right, uh, uh, to use a common term. Now, it wasn't an increase of knowledge from the Bible, was it? Was the Bible written then? No, okay, so this is, this is an increase of knowledge, but the reason I'm making that point is we're going to see the Lord opening the understanding of his disciples at Pentecost. And, of course, when it comes to the Millerites, okay, did the Lord hold his hand over the 1843 chart? When he removed his hand, was there an increase of knowledge? When he removed his hand, what was the increase of knowledge? It allowed them to understand that the prophecies that identified 1843 now confirmed 1844. So I'm just going to put hand here. Okay, that means that in the story of Moses, we have an illustration in, this, in a parallel history. This is the history, brothers and sisters. This is the first Pentecost. This is the last Pentecost. And Sister White uses Pentecost to illustrate not only the midnight cry in the Millerite time period, but the latter rain in our time period. These are parallel histories. Right? The airtight parallel histories. When, the, when, the, when Pentecost came in the time of the disciples, it was the exact day of the year that Moses went up on the mountain to receive the law. That's why they were commemorating it. And in these histories, we find a tearing time in the story of Moses. And we all agree, right? There was a tearing time in the story of the Millerites, correct? Yes. Habakkuk 2, Matthew 25, Daniel 12, 12. There's a tearing time. Um, we're going to show there's a tearing time in the story of the disciples. Perhaps you know it. What, remember um, when Jesus said to the disciples, Tear ye here in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, just before Pentecost? There's a tearing time at Pentecost. Do you remember what happened at, in this particular period of Pentecost? I'll tell you what happened. Maybe we can do this kind of off the top of our heads. It's a pretty simple study. There's a couple of disciples right after the cross that are walking back to Emmaus. And Christ starts walking with them. Right? You all know this story. And they end up sitting down and having a meal with him and then and then suddenly he disappears. And what, he, what did he do when he disappeared? Christ. <coughs> what did he do? No, when he disappeared, what did he do simultaneously? Okay, uh, uh, bad question. It's my fault. My, my fault. He opened their understanding. Okay. He'd been talking with them. They didn't know who he was. And when he left, suddenly, and the, the scripture's saying that, in this time period, in this time part, not period, not only with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, but the other disciples, the scriptures say, he opened their understanding at this point in time to the scriptures. Or, if you will, he removed his hand from their understanding. Okay? And there was an increase of knowledge. So, I haven't found a an expression in the Bible of the Spirit of Prophecy for the history of the disciples at Pentecost where the Lord says that he held the, his hand over their understanding and then he removed their hand. But I have found that it's a very specific teaching that in this time of Pentecost, one of the things that the Lord does, did, is that he opened the understanding of what to his disciples? of God's prophetic word to them that testified of him, okay? So there's, an, there's also in Pentecost, although I'm not claiming that there's a reference in the spirit of prophecy where he says sh sh they, he moved his hand from their understanding, but he opens their understanding, and in that sense, it parallels the increase of knowledge that was given to Moses and the increase of knowledge that was given to the Millerites when he removed his hand from the 1843 chart, as Sister White references in the book Early Writings. In the time of Moses, even though he didn't have scripture to have opened up to him, he did receive God's word, which is what scripture is. Good for you. Yeah, that's how I understand it too. It's, 
It's opening up an understanding of God's word, and that qualifies both ways. In this history, we have 46 days. Now, this, this is a test question. This, is, this has been a mini-prophecy school. This is a test question based upon Friday night and yesterday. In this history, Moses is on the mountain 46 days receiving instruction for erecting the tabernacle sanctuary. In this history, we have recorded by the Jews that it took 46 years to build the literal earthly tank sanctuary. In this history, where do we see, th in the history of the Millerites, where do we see 46 years involved with erecting the temple? 1798 to 1844. The Lord raised up a spiritual house for what purpose? To enter into covenant with him. Because in Malachi 3, the messenger of the covenant was going to what? Come suddenly to his temple. But in order to come suddenly to his temple, what did he have to do? He had to build the temple. And how long did it take him? 46 years to build the temple. So can you say the same for the 2300 uh, prophecy? Would that be, because you got the 46 up there from yesterday. What I'm saying about, what I'm saying about this, is at this point, I don't know how to understand this. Oh, okay. okay. But there's no doubt about it that the 2300 year prophecy says, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be set right. right. Okay, what, what that means is a lot of things. In order for the sanctuary to be made right, you have to have a people that are connected with the, the sanctuary four minutes. And so what I'm saying is this. The prediction of the, the, great, the great jubilee by the Millerites that they marked at the beginning of the destruction, uh, at the destruction of Jerusalem and said it extends all the way to 1844 and they're defining the great jubilee as <coughs> 50, 49 year periods or 49, 50 year periods coming to 2520. It's not on the chart. It's not on either chart. But what I'm saying is I'm not threatened by it. It seems to still stand for me, even if the theologians are threatened by it. But I'm not making a big deal about it. But when I saw this, then I decided, well, what happens if you divide the Jubilee cycles into the 2300-year prophecy, which is about the sanctuary and about building the sanctuary in 1844? And sure enough, if you divide the, f the 50 Jubilee cycle into this, it comes to 46. And upon the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. And what I'm saying is, here, here, and here tells you that 46 years in the scriptures is identifying something in connection with raising up the temple. But I do not know what the implications of this or this are. But I'm not threatened by sharing little novelties that you come across because maybe one of you will figure out what it means. We'll come back after a short break. Heavenly Father, we wish to be those represented by John that by faith take the little book out of your hand and eat it and have the experience of understanding that there's a sweetness uh, connected with the message that's in that little book, but knowing full well that <coughs> it brings a bitterness in its wake. And we know that from inspiration, the only way that we can stand in the time period when every earthly support is cut off and then continue to stand in the time peri period when there's no longer any intercession of sin is to be willing to follow you whithersoever you take us. And we are by faith um, accepting the truth that through inspiration you've told us that we must be students of prophecy and trace this message to its conclusion in order that we can allow the power of your word to effectively change us into your image and empower us for this coming crisis, this bitter time period. We ask that you'd make this message sweet for us, that it would motivate us to continue into our studies, and once again ask you that you'd continue to pour your latter rain out upon us uh, for the remainder of this day. Send your angels, your Holy Spirit, 
and set aside the human thoughts and ideas as we continue on in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.